Self-control. Uh, last month, we for Mother's Day, I talked about patience, and I got a lot of ribbing for that. Because like, why are you talking about patience on Mother's Day? Um, I'm talking about self-control on Father's Day. So, you know, I think we balanced it out a little bit. Um, I did not. <laughs> there's some cheering of the wives. Uh, I'm trying not to read into that. Um, I think when it comes to the, the fruit of the Spirit, just my own personal sharing, I think this is the one that convicts me the most. Because, and the reason it does is because when we talk about self-control, I think the first thing we think about is physical, right? Watch what we eat, get up out of time, exercise. This is probably the biggest area of self-control, especially as guys you struggle with, especially me. I'll just pick on me today instead of like looping us all in. But this is an area of struggle. And in our society, you know, as obesity becomes a bigger, bigger problem, this is usually where we come back to, that we need to be taking care of ourselves physically. But as we read through Scripture, self-control is so much more than just our bodies. Self-control actually has to do with our whole person. And as we dive in this morning, one of the key components of having good self-control is it revolves around the idea of power. When we go through scripture, self-control is, someone who has self-control is described as having the power to contain themselves, to keep their impulses and their their sinful nature really contained. And someone who lacks self-control is described as powerless, overwhelmed by their passions and a slave to their desires. And as I thought about that word, powerless, I was reminded of a couple years ago when we had that freak snowstorm that knocked out the power for a few days. I was stuck in my driveway. It happened on a Saturday night. I couldn't get to the church. My trailblazer couldn't handle the conditions. But for a few days, we were powerless. We couldn't turn on our TV. The heat didn't work. And it it was really uncomfortable, that idea of not having power. And it's not just about electricity. Any situation we find ourselves in life where we feel powerless, it is a really crippling experience. Nobody, especially us guys, but nobody likes to feel powerless. And yet, Scripture describes that if we lack self-control, That is exactly what we are. We are powerless to our emotions, to our desires. And so this morning we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament. um, Of I think we've read if you've read through the story of Daniel, you've probably seen this story. You probably recognize some of the self control that's going into this. Uh, But this story, there's a whole lot more going on than sometimes meets the eye. So, we are in Daniel 1. If you have your physical Bible, as always, it's on the app. It'll be on the screen. As those that need to turn there go, just a little context. (laughs) Uh, The nation of Israel has split into two kingdoms. There is Israel and Judah. Israel has been taken off to captivity to the Assyrians, and Judah remains But the Babylonians have conquered Assyria. They are the dominant empire at the time. They have just conquered Judah and taken a large number of them into captivity. And we pick it up in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Oop. Select, so 
ba- the city of Babylon now has all of these captives in their city. And the king is looking out and he's saying, you know what, I don't want a whole bunch of extra mouths to feed. I don't want a whole bunch of squatters. I want to get something out of all these captives. So he tells his chief of staff, go find the very best. And because it is Judah they have just conquered, he is looking at the nation. He said, I want the very best of the nation of Judah to come. And he's going to put them on this training program. right? He's going to teach them in literature, teach them in language. He is going to enable them to serve in his palace. And he only wants the very best. And to make sure they are the very best, they're going to be trained for three years and they are going to eat from his kitchen. Babylon is the dominant empire. It's not like they put out a survey and they got the KFC chef. Like this is Red Seal, the very best, the very trained. Babylon has conquered so many nations that there are so many delicacies. This is the best of the best. The wine is vintage. It is the expensive stuff. It's not the cheap stuff you get from 7-Eleven. Like this is going to be the best of the best. For three years, they're going to be given this treatment. And then we meet Daniel. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, chosen all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them get with these Babylonian names. Daniel was named Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. If you know the story of the furnace, those three of those names should sound fairly familiar. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. In the first five books of the Bible, part of the instruction that the Lord gives the Israelites is there are certain foods you shall not eat. They are deemed unclean for you. And, you know, save the time, there's a whole bunch of signs. There's really good reason, actually, that God says we shouldn't be eating those foods. But anyways, um, so Daniel comes and he sees all the food and he hears what's going to happen. But because he doesn't know where it's coming from, he doesn't know how it was prepared, there are so many unknowns and he still loves the Lord his God. And so he, and as a Jewish boy, and if he was of the royal family, he would have had the whole Old Testament up to this point memorized. He knew the word. And he knew that there's a risk that there's food in there that he shouldn't be eating. He was willing to, He wanted to honor his God despite all of the delicacies. And so he goes to the chief of staff and he says, listen, I can't eat this stuff. I want to eat vegetables and water. He's going to say this a little bit later. And the the chief of staff is like, yeah, sure, let's do this. No. He's like, you're crazy. You're not going to eat meat. Okay, I think we can all agree with that. That just sounds crazy. He said, if you don't eat this good stuff and you start to fail, and if you're going to start to grow pale and thin and start dragging behind, I'm going to be punished for treating you special. So he instantly hits opposition. And not only is the chief of staff at risk, there's a good chance that Daniel and his friends are at risk too. Because if they refuse this generosity, they refuse this hospitality, the king will take it personally because he's going to know. He's not going to be ignorant. He's not going to miss this. He's going to know if this gift is being neglected. So the chief of staff says, this is a bad idea. But if you know anything about the story of Daniel, Daniel is not afraid to take a few risks. Continue on, verse 11. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days. You're supposed to get this food for three years. He just wants 10 days. On a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. 
At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, Daniel and his three, friend, three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been assigned, the, been eating the food assigned by the king. So after the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of food and wine provided for the others. Um, the application point today is not to stop eating meat. Okay? Just want to clear the air there because if I say that, we're losing everybody. I'm leaving if we go vegan, okay? I just so we're all on the same page. And Daniel didn't even do it for his for the rest of his life. He's just asking for this allowance for these three years that he doesn't eat anything that may defile him. He says, "Test me for ten days. Just give me vegetables and water and see how I compare." Now it's not just like this chief of staff took Daniel and his friends to a separate room so they could have their special meal and they, you know, were treated all this special. No, 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 no. They still had to sit in the same room as all these other people. And it's not like they were the only Jews. He's sitting with Jews, violating the food laws, eating these delectable variety of things the smells, the sounds, the ribbing. Yesterday at the KLBC tournament, they fed us ribs, burnt ends, and brisket for our meal. And it, what, what, the only comparison I can think of is if we walk in and see all this food and smell all these meats, and I'm like, I want a salad. If I would have sat with the guys I was sitting with, and just eating salad, they would have ribbed me. They would have given me a hard time, and they should have. You're missing out. Oh, oh, it's so tender. It's so good. You know that Daniel and his friends are not eating this in peace. They're, they're family. They're friends. All around them, they have to smell the smells. They have to see it. It's not like, oh, that looks gross. Oh, no. This looked amazing they probably sat right in the middle of it all so all around them the meat and the delicacies being consumed this isn't just a exercise in physical self-control daniel has to guard his mind because all it needs you just need to give an inch right you just have to think oh it'd be okay just this one time just be okay this one meal. Just to have one little bite. He has to be controlled in his mind. He has to be controlled in his words. Because, you know, if he's anything like us and someone's giving us a hard time, kind of want to give it back. He has to be so controlled for three years as he's trained and built up and all of this is happening around him and it's not like it was three set meals a day this food just kept coming the tables would have been full all the time so that they could go eat whenever they wanted it was the best of the best and he had to say no day after day for three years I don't know about you, but that is self-control. That is the ability, that is power over yourself to resist this. But he's like, no, my belly may want it. My mind may ha make excuses for it, but I am going to honor my God and I am going to resist. And as Daniel exhibits this high level of self-control in the midst of persecution, in the midst of the pressure to give in, Peter tells us that we are to exhibit the same. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For God has called you to do good, even if it means suffering, as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his footsteps. You must do good even if it means suffering, even if it means persecution, even if it means getting uncomfortable, you must, sac you must practice self-control. And as I said, it's of 
self-control of the whole person. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come, when you, come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Practice self-control of your minds. Practice. Guard your mind. Put all those thoughts that are contrary to the things of God at the feet of Jesus. Self-control of your thoughts. Self-control of your words. Psalm 141.3 Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. Be controlled in what you say. Don't say the first thing that pops into your head all the time. And of course, it transforms changes our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do whatever, I sh- whatever it should. Otherwise, I fear that after my preaching to others, I might be disqualified. Paul saw self-control even of his body, to control what he ate, control to, be, to treat his body as the temple that it was meant to be treated as. Self-control impacts our whole body but how do we grow in self-control i think that is the number that's the big question it's one thing to talk about it but how do we get better at it how do we control our tongue that james says is so hard to control how do we resist the snack food that starts piling up in the pantry because you're not eating it how do we resist cleaning up our kids plate so that we're not wasting food how do we resist maybe i'm just speaking of myself but how do we practice that extra level of self-control? I'm going to use an analogy that I've u- or an acronym that I've used lots. Um, so you've heard this before, but I'm going to keep sharing it with you because it is the best one that I can come up with when it comes to our spiritual growth. It's STAR. So number one, stop. Before you do something impulsive, whether it's having a snack or saying something just out of the... <laughs> out of impulse stop and take a breath and those two are sometimes the hardest ones to do stop take a breath clear your head clear your emotions clear it all and then ask Jesus for wisdom God <laughs> Help me respond in this situation so I don't say something that I shouldn't. Or so I don't say something that makes it worse. God, help me to see the goal of why I'm trying to be self-controlled. Help me see the goal of why I'm trying to be disciplined. God, remind me. Ask for his wisdom. But it's not as ask and be like, okay, I did my part. Uh, R is respond. When you ask, actually wait for Jesus to say something. Jesus, what is the correct answer? And then be patient enough to hear the answer. Have ears to hear because God still speaks. God still moves. Jesus said that man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So stop and ask, God, help me in this. What should I do? And then respond accordingly. If you will grow in self-control, if you will grow in keeping these impulses and these gut movements, it's going to have not only a huge impact on you, but it's going to have impact on the relationships. Right? It's going to have a huge change. How many times have we responded to something impulsively and made it significantly worse than when it started? Maybe it's just me. (laughs) Maybe my tongue is just faster than my brain sometimes. I'm like, ah, get back in there. We can control our emotions and our thoughts. How many times have we had a relationship fall apart because our brain drew conclusions that weren't there? Because we didn't guard our thoughts. Because we, we came to the worst possible conclusion. We've talked about how peace and goodness and kindness isn't assuming the worst, but hoping for the best. That was love right out of the gate. Not assuming the worst, but hoping for the best. Guard our minds so that our brains don't default to what is wrong with the situation. If we can grow in self-control, it's going to help us. It's going to help our relationships. It's going to help our friendships. 
But the reality is, is that if we don't grow in it, there's a lot working against us to make sure we're not. Peter says this in 2 Peter. False teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain. They delight in deception even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people to sin. And they are well trained in greed. They live under God's Curse. Peter says the reason we need to grow in self-control and over summer we're going to look at the books of Peter and he is going to come back to self-control and self-discipline because he said there's people coming. We have a spiritual enemy who's going to send his agents and they're going to try to trick you. They're going to tell you lies, but they're going to be really good. They're not going to stand out. They're actually going to be part of your church. And they're going to tell you that, oh, self-control is a sham. Oh, just enjoy life. Eat, drink, and be merry. They're going to tell you that it's, it doesn't matter because God will forgive. So just do whatever you want. And Peter's like, no. You've been called to self-control. You've been called to righteousness and purity and holiness. You've been set apart. Do not get caught up in the things of this world, but be centered on the things of God. We need to grow in self-control physically, mentally, verbally, because there's people coming who are going to try to derail you by the things that they teach and the things that they say and ultimately try to get you to do the things that are contrary to everything we've talked about the last nine weeks. Be self-controlled because there's going to be those that are going to come and are going to try to steal it from you. And the way we prepare is we grow in this. So one of the things we're going to do this morning at your table, I'm going to hand out the questions I forgot to. Um, so I want you to take some time this morning at your table, close your eyes, have a conversation with God, say, God, where do I need to grow? Maybe he needs you to go back over this series that we've done and say, hey, you need to refresh yourself on the love series. And this is the area I want you to grow. Maybe it's just watching your words. Maybe maybe it's not something we talked about, but something I touched on this morning. Whatever it is, don't pick the one you think you should do, but obey and follow the one that God tells you to do. And then ask Him to guide you through it. God, help me grow in this. Not only for myself, but for my family and my friends and my work. And then practice the control to be diligent in it. To not just try for an hour and be like, oh, I failed. But to commit to a week or two weeks or a month or however long the Spirit enables you. The beautiful thing we have at our tables is it's not just a matter of talking about it, but you have accountability partners. You're like, this is the one. I need your help. Because you can't do it alone. And praise God, the power to do this doesn't reside within us, but it resides in the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, giving us the ability to overcome, to be diligent, and to be disciplined in all the things that He is leading us into.